got his stuff set up and ready to take it away from the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Um, I'll let him have it from here. All right, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, actually, is it okay if I don't use the microphone, if I just project? Well, I think they're okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. yeah. that's fine. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you all for coming today. Um, so, a uh, bit of a, a quick background. Uh, so, I, I work at uh, Tufts University School of Medicine as part of their Doctor of Physical Therapy program. It's a long story, but it's a, um, it's a hybrid program, so some remote, some in person. And long story short is I live in North Carolina, even though I work for someplace uh, a little bit further away. And um, Chris Nowitzki called me up. He's uh, the founder of Concussion Legacy Foundation. And uh, he uh, asked me if I could uh, fill in and, and uh, give this talk here. Uh, I'm very familiar with concussion research and everything, but this is my first time giving this talk compared, uh, given by Concussion Legacy Foundation. Uh, hopefully it goes well. I think uh, everything should be good. But again, first time uh, doing it in case, any, uh, in case there's any hiccups on, on my part. Um, so uh, that's me. Um, I, I actually used to work around here at High Point University. I worked here for 11 years, and just actually in February, I switched over to uh, Tufts University, and uh, where I'm the director of uh, research and faculty development there. And um, basically, uh, my, my path to concussion prevention. Uh, so I'm a little bit of an oddball in, in many different ways, but uh, my original background, I'm actually a veterinarian by background. I started off as a veterinarian, went through vet school, all that stuff, and then I decided, uh, long story, but kind of a career change, uh, and uh, went and got a PhD in sports medicine uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. And um, for those that are familiar with the University of Pittsburgh, if anybody's seen the concussion movie um, with uh, Will Smith, uh, you know, there's a lot of concussion work that actually originated in Pittsburgh. A lot of the famous physicians and everything are actually based out of um, Pittsburgh. Um, but I actually do, I didn't do anything with concussion while I was there. I got involved in it a little bit later. And um, this is actually kind of how I started getting involved with concussion. Um, this is actually from uh, this January, 2023 here. Um, and the question you know, from, there's a lot of articles about this. What are NFL players wearing around their necks? Um, does anybody, has anybody seen this thing they're wearing around their necks? You know, anybody want to say what it is? Anybody know? Volunteers? Anybody? So uh, it's called the Q Collar, and um, it's a uh, concussion prevention uh, device that came out uh, quite a few years ago. And um, so this is back in 2017. Um, Luke Keekley uh, of the Carolina Panthers was the first player to start wearing uh, the Q Collar. And so as you can see, uh, again, many headlines from that time, 2017, um, Luke started wearing this woodpecker collar to prevent concussions. And so uh, in short, uh, this, this collar was designed to um, mimic the physiology of a woodpecker. And uh, basically, uh, there's some researchers that found that studied woodpeckers for a long time and found that like if you compress the jugular veins, woodpeckers compress the jugular veins, and it prevents uh, it, it prevents blood from getting back from the brain into the heart, and it kind of creates this bubble wrap for the brain and can prevent concussions. So um, anyway, that's, that's the story behind that. Keekly started wearing this. Um, the only, so as a veterinarian turned PhD in sports medicine and exercise physiology, um, the only issue that I had with the story of Keekly wearing this was it didn't make any sense from a scientific perspective, none at all. Um, and I actually started getting into this back in 2014 when they started doing some, when, when some research started coming out on it. And so basically, this is how I got involved in concussions. Um, I started writing some articles based in, in peer-reviewed journals, British Journal of Sports Medicine, Journal of Applied Physiology, explaining how this didn't make any sense, both as a veterinarian and a physiologist, th this, wasn't, this wasn't true. Like, there's no actual evidence anywhere in hundreds of years, literally hundreds of years of woodpecker research that woodpeckers do this, um, that basically any research on the human side of things, the juggler compression, there's, there's, this, is, this is a complete fabrication. Um, and I, I don't use that term loosely. Like there, there's like some, some real ethical problems with, with all the research behind this and all the, the promotion behind this. And um, even still, and I, I started publishing some stuff in, in and other peer-reviewed journals like JAMA, JAMA Neurology, um, about how all the clinical trials that have done to show that this, this brain protection collar works. 
are highly flawed. And, and that's how I got into this, because I noticed something that sounded really cool, but it falls apart. Um, you know, the, the more you, you pull on the sweater, the more it unravels. And so that's how, why I'm here talking about concussions now. It's something I've been active in in the past many years. And actually, um, the reason I got my PhD in sports medicine and kind of switched careers is I wanted to be able to help people. I want to keep athletes safe. I want to help athletes uh, do better with rehabilitation, you know, just help make informed decisions. And um, this, this concussion cue color thing was one of these things that I'm like, the, people are going to be making a lot of informed decisions based on wrong information based on testimonials from athletes who are selling the product, based on um, science that's highly flawed, and it's really, it's high level science that you really have to understand um, at a pretty deep level to see through some of the issues with it. And I don't have any conflicts of interest. I'm not selling any, any competing products or anything like that. What is the name that you called it before you said it was going to look like? Q collar. Q as in the letter Q uh, collar. So um, anyway, that, that's how I'm here. Um, and uh, my, my uh, and, and from a journalist standpoint, from, a, from that standpoint, my big achievement was I, I worked with um, the uh, a reporter from New York Times, Matt Futterman, sports reporter, uh, to get an article about this into the New York Times. And that was really challenging from my perspective because um, essentially from a journalism standpoint, all the reporting on this was just glowing. Um, they interviewed people from the company that makes it, who, who profit from it. They interviewed players that wear it who aren't experts in science, and they would tell you all about the science behind it, but they're, they're, they're not scientists. They haven't studied this for 15 years or anything like that. And, and nobody found my articles, and again, I'm, I, I don't care that nobody found my articles, but nobody reported both sides. For the most part, 98% of the articles on this just kind of gushed over this is gonna be the solution to concussions when they weren't actually interviewing unbiased or independent scientists that weren't involved in it, um, people that didn't have conflicts of interest. They kind of trusted the company company that says it works and the athletes who believe it works, that's what the reporting was. Um, so, so from my standpoint, uh, one of the things, when, if you're ever reporting on concussions or sports injuries in general, um, and there's new research coming out all the time, the research isn't perfect. People have conflicts of interest. People have profits, especially in the sports medicine world. There's a lot of pseudoscience out there. And that's how I kind of got into concussion. And, um, and it was a big challenge to, to, get the, to get reporters to get traction on it. Um, and so this just came out in December of last year. And kind of one of the things I've gone on to with uh, concussion reporting now is um, just, you know, everybody might have seen the Guardian caps in the NFL. The NFL is really touting that. Science behind it, eh, a little bit unproven. Right, right now, it's, it's, but it's one of the big stories from last year. So that's a little bit about my background, how I got into concussion research, why I know this literature, um, how I teamed up with uh, some people at the Concussion Legacy Foundation uh, to, uh, to be here presenting today. So um, outline for today, I'll talk about what is the Concussion Legacy Foundation and what is the media project. We'll talk a little bit about concussion 101. Um, we'll do a little bit about uh, the history of concussion reporting and then uh, Probably the, the biggest important thing here is concussion reporting uh, recommendations. The Concussion Legacy Foundation has put together uh, recommendations to help journalists, to help the media report accurately on concussions. We'll talk about why that's so important, and then we'll do uh, some Q&A. Um, so again, just a little bit about Concussion Legacy Foundation. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization co-founded in 2007 uh, by uh, Dr. Robert Cantu uh, over here, who's one of the uh, leading experts on sports concussions. And then uh, Dr. Chris Nowinski, uh, he's a PhD. Uh, he is actually a, uh, that, that studies concussions um, and, and um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And uh, he's actually a former football player. And actually, he wrestled in uh, what is now WWE. He was a professional wrestler for a while. So this is somebody that has firsthand experience with concussions and concussion culture and uh, these types of sports injuries who has, has vowed to make a, a difference and help make everything in concussion reporting more accurate and help pe make people better uh, informed, uh, better decision decisions. Uh, and again, the vision of uh, Concussion Legacy Foundation is a role without CTE which is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. That's a long-term condition that you get from repetitive head impacts and improve concussion safety without compromise. Um, and so uh, again, the, the kind of the, the media project uh, started with Dr. Winnowinski talking to a lot of uh, you know, uh, 
journalists and famous media uh, reporters basically asking, how do we help the media cover sports concussions? And as we'll see, um, a lot of people, this is how they learn about concussions. They learn about it from reporting. And so journalists and, and reporters have a really important job as, as far as educating the public uh, on this. And if you say the right things, if you say everything accurately, the public, including children, will have a good understanding. And if people get it wrong, even without bad intentions, but again, if if you if if you if anything is reported incorrectly or inaccurately, um, then then people start to get the wrong idea, and that can really have an effect on on uh, decisions and health. Um, so the Concussion Legacy Foundation's uh, media project, uh, they've got a full concussion reporting workshop that they do, um, which is a curriculum taught at journalism schools to educate media professionals. And again, this today is just kind of a, a snippet of, of what they do, just a few of their lessons. And then um, you could actually get a, a concussion reporting certificate, uh, which is a certification for working media professionals that demonstrate uh, their, uh, their fluency in, rep in reporting concussions correctly. All right, so um, this is uh, the part of the media project. Again, uh, Concussion Legacy Foundation put together this whole uh, presentation. And uh, this is just uh, a snippet of children talking about concussions. Unfortunately, I uh, don't have audio set up in the room, so I've put my speaker as high as I can, so hopefully everybody can hear it. All right, so it, it might be a little bit dramatic that as, as reporters you can help kids save their lives and save their, save their brains, but it's really true. It's, it's not like you know, there's a concussion 101 class that, that's, that kids get before they sign up for contact sports. Um, so uh, anything in particular that stood out for anybody in here? Any comments that really struck them? Any? It, 
you're, it's not that you're not the only child. Most don't, I would, I would even say. R really insightful comments, too, about you don't even know it till a few days later. And, and that, that's a really important one that a lot of people don't recognize. Uh, again, this idea that a player gets up and they get back in the game and they're up. They might have a concussion and not know it. A lot of times the symptoms don't show up for a few days later. And so again, you get back in the game, you could, we'll talk about it a little bit later, could make it even worse. Any other comments in that video? We used to hear the term getting your bell wrong, and it wasn't with fear that we heard that or said that. Right. And it is now. Yeah, yeah, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, no, he just, he just got his bell wrong. Not a big deal. It's a brain injury, you know, right? <laughs> The, the coach has everybody's best interest in mind and cares about the kids, so if he says get back in, you should get back in, right? Anything else? Yeah, one last one. It sounded like the, uh, the boys in the video were more get back in their play and the, the, uh, the young ladies in the video were more cautious about what could happen if they do get back in there. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's interesting you, you, you notice that too, because that is a real phenomenon too. Um, there's been a lot of research done for both parents and children on their attitudes towards concussion. And, um, you know, and, and for the boys especially, there is definitely more of a toughness, like you need to get back in the game. And, and that comes from a combination of different things. Um, parents, coaches, media, you know, so the media, them, you know, covering the athletes, and also to the athletes themselves. When the athlete is, you know, saying, you know, look, you know, I owe it to my team. You know, I just had to tough it out. And, and we see this in sports. There's a lot of things with toughing it out. Um, you know, just even even something as simple as ankle sprains. Um, again, people think of an ankle sprain as oh, it's just an ankle sprain. A player gets back in, and it's really tough. Okay, maybe he can play the next, you know, he could play through the ankle sprain, but his long-term ankle health and his risk for future ankle sprains go way up. And, and, but still, there's a, there's a toughness. Like, he did it despite that. Um, and, you know, so, so that's, and, and concussion is definitely one of those things that uh, there's, toughness is reward. We'll see some other examples of, of that as we go through. Um, so, yeah, this, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, and again, some of these, you know, kids are, are given, you know, some prompting and everything, but a lot of times, they, they trust their coach and, and they've learned these things uh, from a combination of different factors. Um, so uh, the goal here is to you know, try to change some of the concussion culture and better education so kids can have a better understanding and, and make more informed decisions and same thing with the parents too. Um, so basically what well, next part we'll do is concussion 101 um, and, and just a little bit about what concussions are and bit about signs and symptoms. Um, so basically, concussion, to, like, the, the, the focus for today is concussion. And a concussion is a single event. It's a single distinct event, a single hard hit. Um, and it's caused by that. And it's, it's a mild traumatic brain injury that causes temporary changes to how someone thinks, acts, and feels. And again, uh, thank you for a great example of zinging feeling undescribable that's how someone feels right there and, and again this is one of the things a concussion is symptomatic it's something that somebody is feeling and it's changing you know it's changing something about them and we might and we might not be able to pick it up um, just by signs or something that's more visual alone and we'll see some of the signs of concussion some of the visual signs that you could see in somebody you know, we'll see things like confusion and, and wobbliness and dizziness and things like that. So it's clear. sometimes you can visibly see it, but sometimes, and in many cases, a person, there's nothing obvious about them that's different, but they're feeling it. They're feeling it in their head. They're having weird vision things. They're tired. They've got a headache. So sometimes it's just things that get felt. The other important thing here, too, it's a mild traumatic brain injury. We can, we can group brain injuries into three levels. Mild, which is concussion. Um, moderate, which is, you know, what you might get like from more of a, you know, a, a 
you know, decently bad automobile accident and severe. A severe traumatic, traumatic brain injury, that's gonna be something that you have to be on a ventilator, maybe you live through it, maybe not, um, you know, probably have to go through inpatient, outpatient rehab, you know, that's the type of thing, you know, domestic violence, uh, automobile accident, you know, fall from a ladder or something like that, that's a severe traumatic brain injury. Moderate is the next one down, and some of those people need to be on a ventilator, some don't, but you know, there's some severe damage. When we're talking concussions, it's, it's mild, but it's still a brain injury. It still gets meant, it should still be considered in the same breath with those other types of things. So when people say, oh, it was just a concussion, this is one of the reasons why we really encourage people talking about a mild traumatic brain injury. And a lot of times you'll hear that abbreviated as TBI, traumatic brain injury. It is trauma and it's a brain injury. Um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, that's not what we're gonna be talking a whole lot about today. It's in the news a lot. Um, but it's a degenerative brain disease that's caused by repetitive hits to the head and not just the number of diagnosed concussions. So maybe people that have had more concussions are more at risk, but it seems to be, and there's new research that just came out in the past two weeks, really can helping to confirm the total cumulative number of hits that you take to the head seems to be really associated with chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Okay? So this is kind of more of a long-term condition. This is more of an acute condition. I say long term though, it's been documented in, in athletes as young as in their early 20s that, that have CTE. Um, it can currently be, only be diagnosed after death. The only way to diagnose CTE is on autopsy. So that's the only way that you could, you could actually diagnose it. People might have signs and symptoms that are consistent with it, like confusion and dementia and, and movement disorders and stuff, but we don't know for sure. There's no imaging technique, no brain imaging, no blood test that we can do to diagnose CTE before death. Um, it's found in brains of former football players, hockey players, soccer players, rugby players, military veterans, among other groups. Uh, and um, it's one of these things that's created, like now that we know this, it's a relatively recent thing from the past 15 years or so, now you're, this is kind of where I've come in with some of the marketing stuff, is there's a large market created. People are afraid of CTE, people recognize concussion is bad, and people want to try to prevent it. And it's opened up this market for, dare I say, snake oil salesmen to, um, to sell you know, products that are designed to, to help prevent these things, even if they've got no scientific basis, people still want to buy it. Uh, um, concussions are invisible, um, but there are visible signs of concussion that may indicate a concussion may have occurred. So again, you might, when I say they're invisible, they, you know, you might not be able to, you know, look into a person's brain and see it. It might not show up on imaging or anything like that. But here are some of the signs. Here are some of the signs that happen sometimes where you can actually see it's happening. But again, not every player that gets concussion gets these. So loss of consciousness, that's a, a pretty obvious one. Um, you know, you've got a soccer player that's just kind of laying on the field. Yeah, her eyes are open there. Um, but you, you will see a player gets knocked out. And now we know, like, if, if you get knocked out, you're, you're coming out of the game. But we'll see in a future slide. Up until 2007, you could be unconscious in the NFL and come back in the game. That changed after 2007. But loss of consciousness, that's a big sign. Um, and again, just one thing I'll say about this. Um, everybody's familiar with the DeMar Hamlin incident from January. Um, I, I watched it live on TV, and I actually wound up writing a few articles for mainstream media about it because it was a very different type of, of, of hit. Again, there was definitely a loss of consciousness there, um, but just based on some of the impacts, as soon as it happens, like that looks like this rare condition of commotion of cortis. It was hit to the chest, he got up, he fell back down, very different than, there was no like dazed period as, as we'll see in a little bit. Um, again, this is a famous one of Tua, um, back uh, from the start of the NFL season, posturing of arms and legs. You can see just the way his fingers are. Um, there's a lot of different things that happen with uh, neurological damage that will, some of the different things with the brain tracts as far as certain neurons are being activated and inhibited and, and that changes. And you can see there's this, there's this change in the fingers. There's a lot of different postural things with arms and legs and even torso when somebody gets a brain injury where a lot of times their whole body might stiffen up or something like that. You'll see that in MMA sometimes. Um, and, and again, that's a very clear sign that some kind of central nervous uh, system injury has happened. Again, we're talking about brain injury. It's a mild traumatic brain injury, but it's still a brain injury. Um, balance problems. Uh, again, we can try to spot the player who's having trouble balancing right here. 
See number 35 kind of get up and whoa, he's having some trouble. We saw the same thing with two. Um, and again, that's a clear indicator that there's been some sort of traumatic brain injury uh, that has happened. And one of the things we'll come back to later is we can't just say he has concussion. We can speculate, or, or sorry, I shouldn't say we should, we, we, I shouldn't say we can speculate. We can say his balance appears to be off. His son, he has signs that are consistent with that concussion. He should probably be evaluated. But it's inappropriate to say, oh, he got a concussion. We don't know that. We're not in the field. It could be, there could be some kind of other vestibular thing that's come up. Um, you know, there, but one of the things with reporting is we, we should only verify, we should only say what the facts are. The fact is he appears to be having trouble with his balance that is consistent with a, a, a sign of concussion, he should be evaluated. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. We don't know for sure he's got a concussion at that point. Again, we see rules to evaluate all of them. What's that? And they're making rules and stuff to evaluate all of them. Yeah, absolutely. That's why the thing is so controversial to think that they want to know. Right, yeah, that, that one was <laughs> very controversial. That and, and one of the things that we're gonna come back to later is um, each sport will have its own protocol for how to deal with athletes that might have been concussed. And as a journalist, as a reporter, one of the things that's gonna be important for whatever sport you're covering, you should be familiar with that governing, that sport's governing bodies as, as far as what the rules uh, are and everything. And they're all different. How long somebody could be out after concussion, um, how long, you know, what the evaluation process is, who even makes the decision. Is it the athletic trainer? Is it the team physician? You know, who's making that? So again, I'm not here to say, here's what happens in NFL, here's what happens in Major League Soccer, but whatever sport you're covering, you should try to become familiar uh, with, with the uh, governing bodies for that. Um, again, slow to get up. Uh, that, that's another sign that somebody maybe has, you know, they could have a concussion. There's a lot of things that could cause somebody to be slow to get up, but again, it's, it's one of those signs to be looking for. And a lot of times these don't happen in isolation either. They might be slow to get up, and then when they do get up, they're a little bit, you know, seem dazed or off balance. Uh, clear confusion, number seven here, definitely not looking at his best. Uh, a glazed look in the eyes. Again, you can see uh, the catcher here, he's just kind of, it looks like he's just trying to recompose himself. He's, he's blinking, again, just kind of looks dazed. It's hard to describe this, kind of like a zinging feeling. What does, how would you describe a dazed person? You just kind of know it when you see it, you know, is, is the best example. Again, that's something that's uh, consistent with concussion. Uh, again, uh, dazed or stunned uh, looking, uh, and we'll see another sign like, just got a hit to the head, maybe rubbing your head, grabbing or shaking the head. Um, and one of the things that I'm trying to show here in this presentation, everybody thinks football, concussions, football, concussions. Soccer, basketball, lots of different sports get concussions. They're more common in some than others, but even um, my background is a lot of track and field. Uh, there was just another article recently that came out about hurdlers in track and field. It's, it's, it's a problem that people don't think of. They might trip over a hurdle, get a concussion, pole vaulters. Some, you know, some are falling from a feet, you know, from close to 20 feet high in the air. There, there's some concussion risks there. So even in sports that we don't really think about, as like football, um, which is notorious for it, there is concussion risk. Pretty much, there's there's no sport that is uh, truly safe uh, from concussion. Even golf. Sometimes people get hit in the head with golf balls. Like, I mean, it happens. Um, so uh, we'll we'll take a look at the clip of uh, Tua. So what signs did we see right there? We saw more than one. Yep. Uh, confusion. 
confusion for sure. What else? Balance problems. One more pretty pretty good one at the end there. Slow, well, slow to get up, so four actually. And then also too, you see him grab his head afterwards. So again, these things a lot of times don't happen in isolation. We just saw four signs of concussion uh, right there. Um, I, I would say pretty good reporting right there. You know, the you know, reporter, the, the broadcaster said, oh, yeah, that's not good. You know, he, he should probably be evaluated. You know, there's no on-field diagnosis. So that's a concussion if I've seen one right there. Um, you know, they're, they're, that was uh, pretty decent reporting there. Um, so if concussions are immediately recognized and managed appropriately, most concussions recover in one to three weeks. And again, one to three weeks, that's a substantial amount of time. If you're playing football, uh, that might be two or three games that you miss, and you know, if, if it's you know, high school or college season, that's you know, quarter of the season right there. Um, but again, the idea is uh, if, if you do recognize them and, and take the appropriate protocols, people do recover uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of times. And there's a bunch of research, you know, if you get more concussions over the course, you know, if, you come, if you've had one concussion this season, you come back after three weeks, are you at greater risk of another one? And the answer is, Probably, you know, so it, just because you've recovered, you might, you, you might be able to be fully capable, but you might be at greater risk again. The thing is, if you play without, a, if you play without recovering fully, you're at greater risk of more severe, um, more severe brain damage. And, and that's what we saw with Tua. That, that was one of the things that was so controversial with him, because he clearly had signs, some protocols weren't followed, and, and then he played again next week, and you look at what, and he had a really severe uh, concussion after that. So again, the idea is uh, immediately recognize the manager properly. And there's a lot of research, it's still very much an ongoing area of research, what exactly you should be doing for uh, your management. Should you be resting? Should you be lightly exercising? Should you be, uh, now one of the things that they do uh, with kids is uh, basically uh, decrease mental stimulation so maybe you shouldn't be going to school or maybe you shouldn't be like sitting in a calculus class right after you've gotten a concussion so just trying to decrease metabolic activity in the brain and this is all stuff in the past you know 10 or so years and I would say that any of the science is settled we're doing our best to try to figure out how to manage concussion appropriately and maybe 10 years from now what we're saying today will be a little bit different but based on current research you know following the concussion management protocols, we're, we're doing our best um, with that. And again, if you manage what we think is appropriately, most people will recover one to three weeks. Some people won't recover in one to three weeks. Some people, even if they sit out, even if they're doing all the right things, some people will get something known as post-concussion syndrome, where they have persistent headaches, where they have migraines, where they have that zinging feeling well beyond three weeks. Maybe it's four weeks, maybe it's six weeks, maybe it's six months. Maybe they've got this feeling that never quite goes away. Um, and so that, that's one of the things that does happen with concussions that we do uh, need to be aware of. But most will heal. Uh, again, uh, no scaremongering techniques here. Uh, one of the things that Concussion Legacy Foundation says here is they're, they're unavoidable in a lot of uh, situations. People are going to keep getting concussions as long as there's contact sports. And it's not a death sentence. It's not like if you've had it, you know, your whole life is ruined, but we wanna to try to prevent them, we wanna to try to manage them, and, and there is some risk when, when you've had it, but a lot of times people can fully recover in one to three weeks. Just check the time here. Um, athletes continue to play with concussion increase the risk for longer recovery, um, and youth and uh, youth athletes miss more school and other sports. And again, why I just mentioned here, this uh, persistent post-concussion syndrome, uh, months to years of symptoms, and again, this is not just affecting like how you feel. It's going to affect social relationships. It's going to affect your education. Um, you know, it, it has major implications if you if you have something like that. And then the really dangerous one is the second impact syndrome. It's pretty rare, but it does happen. You get a concussion today. You come back in a week, or especially bad if it's like within another day or two. That second time you get a concussion something called second impact syndrome, a concussion on top of a concussion, can, be, um, can, can basically be a life or death situation. You have a 50% a mortality rate uh, from that. Um, so again, this is why a you know, high school kid gets hit in the head, gets back in the game. Second concussion can literally kill them if, if uh, that happens if they haven't recovered. 
Um, second part here, changing uh, concussion culture. Um, basically, a lot of uh, what has happened with concussions has dramatically changed since 2007. Um, like I said previously, NFL players were still allowed to return to the same game after concussion with loss of consciousness in, 20, in 2007. Think about the second impact syndrome like I just mentioned. I mean, this could literally kill people. Um, and the NCAA did discourage um, returning knockout players to the game until 20, 2009. So again, what we, everything that we're doing now, it's pretty new in the past 15 years or so. Ira Cassidy leads a team of NFL doctors who did a study of several hundred active players and reported that the concern over head injuries is overblown. Is there any evidence, as far as you're concerned, that links multiple head injuries among pro football players with depression? No. With tension? No. With early onset of Alzheimer's? No. Is there any evidence as of today that, that links multiple head injuries with any long-term problem like that in NFL players? Yeah. No. So that was 2007. Have things changed? Yes. And, and again, the research was still evolving. Research, science, you know, it, it's continually evolving. At that time, it didn't exist. And the, the answer wasn't, well, no, we haven't researched it. No, we don't know. They, <laughs> research really hadn't been done yet. And it was a very definitive no. Uh, and again, uh, so, so this is one of the, you know, the, how the attitude used to be uh, in, in, in the past. Um, I'll just look a, bit, a little bit about um, uh, some, some of the concussion culture. Uh, you know, we're, we're kind of used to be almost kind of glorified. So again, some of the culture that used to be uh, there, you know, celebrating hard hits, it was part of the entertainment. Um, and, you know, I mean, they even put a target on his head um, at, at the one point there. Uh, and again, that's, um, you know, these, these hits used to be glorified. And now um, that's changing. Uh, now you've got a bunch of pro athletes uh, speaking out, talking about uh, how, how Concussions are risky. How head impacts are dangerous, and uh, and this is there's kind of been this grassroots movement as, as players have have become aware of the risks, and we've seen people getting CTE in lots of different sports, not just football. Now you've got quotes like Amy, uh, Abby uh, Wambach here. I cringe at never players go to hit a soccer ball. I cringe at my former self, risk tank self, because we only have this one brain. Um, and, and again, that's that's uh, you know we're seeing this a lot more from the athletes. Um, and again, athletes are now thinking beyond the sport. Um, you know, if I have no good in life if I don't have a proper brain. So again, just this idea of protecting the brain. From my standpoint, kind of getting back to what I talked about earlier, this is really create a market for a lot of pseudoscience products out there. I want to protect the brain. Somebody's like, well, I've got some snake oil that helps protect your brain. Sign me up. Um, and, and there's, again, just as a fun story, back in 2014, 14, I think it was, there was a study that came out of the University of Maryland uh, claiming that uh, a certain brand of chocolate milk helped protect athletes' brains. School superintendent purchased $25,000 worth of this chocolate milk for the football team. And it later came out that it was, there was research fraud involved, it was never a published study and everything. But the point is, people want to protect their brain, people want to be healthy, so everybody jumps on the first thing that says they'll protect the brain. All right, so some concussion reporting uh, recommendations here. Um, again, this is part of the uh, Concussion Legacy Foundation's media project with 22 do's and don'ts for concussion reporting. We'll just highlight a few today. Um, one, I've already said this, don't speculate on whether a player has or does not have a concussion or speculate on a player's specific symptoms like, oh, he must, he, you know, he must have you know, a headache right now. That's gotta, you know, I bet he can't, you know, I bet he's seeing stars. Um, Basically, do report on what you know to be true, such as whether a head impact has occurred, um, and maybe even the type of head impact. Oh, his head hit the ground there. His head hit the ground there, um, or hit another player, or got hit in the head with an elbow. Um, whether the player has exhibited concussion signs from a medical standpoint, a sign is something that we could see, like that 
loss of balance, that slowness getting up, that holding the head, and what should happen next according to concussion protocol. He should be taken out and looked by the team, at, by the team doctors, or the athletic trainer should come onto the field and evaluate him. So again, those are all the facts. This is according, you know, not your opinion, like, oh, he needs to be seen by a doctor. NFL protocol says this, or MLS protocol says this. In the major league, the next step for somebody that's exhibiting signs like this should be this. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Do report what you know to be true, such as whether a head impact is, oh, um, uh, Grace said that. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, yeah, and again, speculation is unnecessary and, and simplifies the diagnostic uh, process. And again, there is a diagnostic uh, uh, process here. It, it, it could be a concussion, it could be a neck injury, some kind of other spinal cord injury. Right away with DeMar Hamlin, a bunch of people are like, oh, that's concussion. Actually, it wasn't, it was a heart issue. If, if, if one speculates and says what it is, it, it does oversimplify what is actually happening and, and might not be accurate. And, and again, it could, you know, if you, if you speculate and you're wrong, people lose credibility in you. Uh, so again, just trying to stick with uh, the facts. All right, um, so we'll listen to uh, what uh, Tony Romo has to say about Dak Prescott. So once again there, just best practices. Tony Romo, Tony Romo is not a doctor. He's not on the field. He doesn't, he didn't ask, do you know where you are? Uh, we don't know that's concussion right there. And, 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 and it might be, very well might be. But again, just trying to be accurate and, and, and preserve uh, journalistic integrity by just reporting on the facts. Wow, that looked like a hard hit from here. Looks like he's grabbing his head, slow to get up. You know, it's, it, there's some signs that he might have concussion. He should be evaluated. Make sense to everybody? Uh, let's see here. Um, through the, uh, so basically, uh, don't cover an event um, without a thorough understanding of the governing uh, concussion protocols, uh, the, the governing body's concussion protocols, or access to the protocol. And again, these are a lot of times are freely available online. The NFL has all theirs uh, out there. Uh, it might be different for high school versus college versus pro football. Um, each sport has has a different. Uh, protocol involved, NBA, they're all different. So again, if, if you're working in a specific field, make sure you try to you know find out what the protocol is. Yeah. I just want to say soccer is the hardest one because I think you're not allowed to make three or four substitutions. Mm -hmm. Unlike basketball and football, you can just bring them. So then it's the hardest one to control that concussion because if you need to take them out, you just burn the substitution. Yeah. And so then people will be like, slow that. And I'm like, yeah. okay, Tim, just want to go that way. Or, right. okay, car would go that. Right. No. It, 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 yeah. Uh, and 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 that is that is so true. Uh, you know. And 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 the thing is, you know, we can think of now the NFL is kind of the NFL has really tried to change, you know, how people perceive it. They've got spotters out there in the stands looking for it, and even still, like, they're they're really trying to do a good job, you know, and, and, and spotting it. And they'll still miss it. Just that the spotters won't even get it. Soccer. Yeah, you've got this conflict of interest. Where it's like, all right, well, you know, we're early in the game. That looks like a pretty bad head impact. Well, we're going to be we're going to be down one player for the next. You know, we, we burn one, and, and so it, it's true. Every sport, and that's kind of where the playing through it and the toughness and heroism comes from. And that's one of the things uh, that's trying to be changed in some of the culture. So, uh, again, um, do your research to find uh, a league's concussion protocol. Uh, if you can't find it online, uh, try to ask somebody. Uh, usually, the athletic trainers, um, the athletic trainers are you know one of the primary points of contact that should know all that. Uh, again, even just a verbal con you know conversation with them before any event, uh, asking you know what is the concussion protocol for this, um, and that's true of you know any type of uh, injuries. Um, so again, uh, see, it looks like some of these slides are, are duplicated. Um, and again, knowing the, the leak's concussion protocol allows you to anticipate how concussion signs should be managed, um, and as well as recognize and spotlight when protocols are breached. Again, going back to the soccer thing, 
Uh, so soccer example, if, if you're seeing visible signs, you saw a head impact, you saw a player holding the ground, or holding their head, uh, slow to get up, looking a little bit dazed, and a substitution doesn't happen, as a reporter, you could be calling that out. Well, that's that's not what I'd expect here. You know, the English Premier League, their protocol specifically states when somebody sees these signs, you know, the athletic trainer or the physiotherapist or the, the doctor should be coming in. I, I, I'm personally surprised because to me, that looked like he should be evaluated. You know, that, that type of, and that's where knowing the protocol uh, comes into play. So thank you, again, good example. Uh, kind of, you know, set me up with a pitch and to, to hit it, I like it. So, um, there's uh, a few different uh, types of mechanism. Uh, a hit to the head, and uh, sometimes that, that hit to the head, it might be from another player. It might be a helmet to ground impact, like in the NFL, around 10 to 15% of all concussions are, are helmet to ground impact. Um, I've actually, there's some research coming out that I've done showing that artificial turf, in the NFL at least, artificial turf is more likely to cause concussion than uh, natural grass, so again, that, that is uh, a real thing. And then, then also, too, whiplash, just that whiplash mechanism. You get hit, maybe you don't get hit in the head, but the neck gets snapped back, and just the quick acceleration and deceleration, that can cause concussion. So even if there's not a visible hit to the head, it could still get a concussion that way. Um, interestingly, uh, going back to uh, how I started, talking about Luke Keekley, Back in 20, 2017, he started wearing that woodpecker helmet to prevent concussions. Three weeks after using his woodpecker helmet to get, to get a concussion, he got a concussion live on TV. Uh, my students are very excited to tell me, they're like, Dr. Smolga, Dr. Smolga, he, Luke Keekly got a concussion while wearing the cue car. I'm like, wow, th thanks for letting me know. We watched the video. He doesn't really get hit in the head. It's, it's an impact, shoulder impact. You can see his head come back, and that would look like the mechanism of concussion. I will say that most, uh, most reporters that covered that case uh, that he got a concussion, failed to mention he was wearing an anti-concussion collar while doing so. Um, basically, it was kind of a separate story. Like, everybody kind of forgot what they reported on about the collar. Uh, so again, <laughs> looking at history, doing, doing uh, you know, having full and complete reporting. Uh, so again, these are some things we've uh, reported already. Uh, vomiting is another one that will happen. Um, again, with, with a brain injury, it, people can have nausea afterwards and uh, they, can, they can vomit afterwards. And so again, what to do next? You know, being familiar with who evaluates, how and where. Is it done on the field? Is it done on the sidelines? Is it done at the locker room? Do they get taken away to another facility? Just kind of knowing a little bit about that and how long, when can they come back in the game and how frequently. If they don't have a concussion, maybe they could come back in the game. Maybe in some sports, maybe if, if, you, if you're suspected of a concussion, kind of like soccer, substitution. All right, we're going to take you out. That's it. You're you're you're, you're done. Yeah. Right. Well, that's, that. that's that the headers is is a, a major issue with that. And so we're uh, we're we're running we're running down on, on time here. I want to make sure there's a little bit of time for Q and A. Um, Let's see. We're going to back on our feet, but absolutely, if Sloan wants to come to the side and make sure that she can pass all the concussion protocol to be able to return to the match. So we'll see what Hugh Williams decides once he receives that information. So just, just an example of good reporting here, you know, somebody that's trying to say, okay, we're going to see what's going to happen next. Um, just a few more things. I'll just cover these last few things quickly. Um, basically, here's the current protocols for a lot of sports. Initially, no activity whatsoever, then light activity, increased activity, and then return to team activity. Um, again, this is the proper uh, return of pro uh, play protocols. Each sport's a little bit different, but this is when we say one to three weeks of managing it. Uh, you know, the first few days, they might not have any activity at all. You know, you might be reporting that somebody has not been cleared to return to practice, not even no contact practice. Something along those those lines here. Um, just a few other things. I'll, I'll go through these a little quickly. Um, don't refer to a diagnosed concussion as a head injury. There's a lot of things that can happen in your head, with your skull, with your face. Um, so it's important. Once a concussion is officially diagnosed, refer to it as a concussion 
or a brain injury. Uh, head injury is a term that uh, we're trying to kind of leave out because it's, it's kind of ambiguous. And it also takes away from the fact that it is something in your brain. Um, so again, if you, if you receive an ambiguous diagnosis, try to investigate to get uh, more clarity from whoever you're talking to, whether it's a coach or a media representative or um, team physician or athletic trainer, try to get more clarity if they're just like, it's a head injury, something along those lines. Um, and um, yeah, it's not specific to the brain and, and, and can be a lot of other things. Uh, don't use outdated terms and phrases such as a ding, a bell ringer, shaking off the cobwebs to prevent, uh, to, to diagnose or to describe a concussion. Um, again, use the proper terminology. Concussion, if it's diagnosed already, or a possible concussion, or a brain injury, or a mild traumatic brain injury. Um, and, and again, the, these minimize the seriousness of a concussion. If, if you're using things like bell ringer and dinger and, stuff like that. Uh, again, it, it just it diminishes how serious it is. Um, and again, one of the last points here, don't reference toughness when discussing an athlete who remained in the game after a head impact. Uh, that, that's something that used to be done, now we know that it's, it's dangerous. So again, uh, avoid conversations of toughness when it comes to concussions or possible concussions. Um, you know, insinuating toughness played uh, a, a part in an athlete's ability to stay in the game that really perpetuates this dangerous thing that we saw back to when we talked about the kids. You know, it's like, oh, if the coach says it, you know, let's do it. And, and those boys trying to tough it out. Just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just skip that video. Um, don't be silent when you see a breach of a uh, concussion protocol. Again, if, if, you, if you see something, say something. As a reporter, you know, you, 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 do, have, you do have the ability to say, I'm kind of surprised, you know, give your opinion that it clearly seemed like there are signs of concussion on the field, like the protocol should state, if the protocol is being followed, this is what would have happened. Uh, you know, we'll have to find out why the protocol wasn't followed there. Um, yeah, again, acknowledging the protocol was breached and acknowledge how the protocol was breached. When reporters don't acknowledge protocol violations, families can learn the wrong way of how to manage concussions and that concussions aren't serious. And again, this is the culture that we're uh, trying to change here. And uh, I'll just again skip, skip through the videos here. Um, don't assume all concussions are diagnosed at the time of injury. Once again, thank you for a great example. It might take a few days. You might see a player that gets, uh, that seems to do fine throughout the game, then all of a sudden, you know, two days later, they're on the injured reserve with, with, with a concussion. What happened? A lot of times it shows up after, and a lot of times that's based on the player being honest and reporting symptoms afterwards. There are no visible signs, but they're feeling it, and so that's why that happens uh, a lot of times. Um, I've just got a few slides left. Um, I'm going to uh, just um, go through these quickly. Sorry, I've, I've been a little slow with things. Report, uh, do report the results of the evaluation, but be aware that the athlete may still have a concussion with delayed symptoms. So even if they pass the initial protocol, it's possible a few days later they could uh, report positive. Um, and again, it's all symptomatic. Uh, so you know, players suspected of concussion test could still have one despite a negative test. I'll just, uh, again, just in the interest of time, um, skipping through these. Uh, again, there's no perfect objective concussion test. There'll never be a blood test. There'll never be an imaging test because it's based on symptoms. Um, and the ideal, ideal evaluations last at least 10 minutes and should occur in a distraction-free environment. And there is a possibility for these delayed symptoms. And again, just what I said, it relies on player honesty. You know, a player has to be honest when seeing if they have headaches or, or not. Um, so last few things here, I'll just give a plug for my, my own thing here real quick. Um, you might see me, I, I'm talking to uh, Washington Post tomorrow, just for fun, if you've ever seen the Coney Island hot dog eating contest, um, I did a research paper a few years ago about what is the most number of hot dogs that a human can eat, um, and this it made it to the New York Times. So as 4th of July weekend approaches, and if you see anything about the science of the Coney Island hot dog eating contest, that's me, nobody else has, has Research something that silly before. There's only one of me that's done. So, so if you see that in the news, um, that that was me. Um, 
But uh, anyway, Concussion Legacy Foundation, sorry I've gone over and gone through the last little bit here quickly. Uh, that's who I'm here to really represent today. Um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, feel, feel free to follow them. Um, feel free to talk to me about any questions you have. And then Dan Malloy is uh, the uh, media relations uh, specialist and uh, in charge of communications at Concussion Legacy Fund Foundation. So feel free to get in touch uh, with them. Uh, sorry I ran over a little bit, uh, or you know, not a lot of time for questions, but any questions or comments? Yep. Yep. Um, um, I was just curious, I know I've spoken to Sonia Bell from ESPN, and she despises when people say mild concussion severe concussion, normal concussion. Uh, she just says that all concussions, no matter what it is, are severe. What are your opinions on labeling something a mild concussion or severe concussion or whatever? I see both sides of it. Um, so a concussion, like I said before, is a mild traumatic brain injury. And typically we don't, I, 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 typically we don't differentiate between different the levels of mild traumatic brain injury. It, it, a concussion, a severe one or a, or a slight one, it's still a mild traumatic brain injury. So I would say sticking with mild traumatic brain injury and not getting caught up. But that said, there are some concussions that are worse than others. Some people will have multiple different symptoms. It'll be really disruptive. They'll have migraine, not be able to sleep, severe headache, vomiting, nausea, dizziness. And some people might only have one or two of those signs. They've just got a headache. So there are different degrees, but I think saying a mild concussion just kind of makes it sound like, a, you know, well, it's really not that bad. It's still a traumatic brain injury. So that's kind of my opinion on it. Great question. Yep. Uh, I'm an NFL beat writer. I've written about artificial turf and yep. players who swear that it's just bad and couldn't fly in their career. You mentioned that you think you study yep. 10 to 15% of contacts that can turf. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to answer that a little bit later, um, with maybe uh, after, I know I want to be on time, but 10 to 15% of concussions in the NFL are due to helmet to surface impacts, so to helmet the field, and um, basically the research I've got, I'm happy to send you the, the, the paper, it's, it's, it's going to be hot off the press shortly, um, basically artificial turf increases the risk of concussion in NFL players by around 30%, but that's depending on temperature and time of season. It's, it's actually pretty highly nuanced. Uh, let's talk uh, af afterwards, and I'll, I'll, I'll send you my, my reference with it. it it's it's, it's yeah. pretty pretty cool stuff, actually. And so as a follow-up to that, I, don't, I know you're new to the Legacy Foundation. Mm -hmm. Do they think the NFL's Red Hat system is working? Is, is, is your foundation, do you that protocol for in place or I, I don't feel comfortable answering that question. I honestly don't know. Um, I'm, I, I'm, not a, I'm not officially part of the Concussion Legacy Foundation. So I, I would say uh, definitely get in touch with them to ask. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know what their stance is on that. Good, good question. Yep. One more question. Uh, that was actually, it was, it was similar. Yeah. So. Got it. Okay. Cool. Any, anything else they can grab you afterward, yeah, I guess? Please grab me afterwards. Yeah. Sorry, I went right to the time here. <laughs> Hopefully it's good. Let me know if you've got any questions. And again, feel free. All good. That's uh, very good stuff. Thank you, Dr. Smolaga. Appreciate that.